We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm happy to welcome you at the 16th Open Forum at the Internet Governance Conference. Um, forum, sorry. My name is Zoltan Turbek, and, uh, and I'm happy to welcome you here. Um, I'm an international lawyer, and I currently work as a, as a di director at the Ministry of Hungary, Minister of Foreign Affairs. And I, in the last two years, I also had the privilege to, to serve as a co-chair of the Kahai Policy Development Group, which was set up by, by the Council of Europe. And uh, we are here today to learn about this uh, uh, very unique initiative, uh, the so-called globalpolicy.ai, uh, and also about how the member uh, intergovernmental organizations of this initiative wish to achieve impact through intergovernmental and interinstitutional cooperation on AI. So as you, as you, as I guess many of you know, this initiative was launched in, in September earlier this year, and, and it is a platform aimed at helping uh, policymakers and the public to navigate the international AI governance landscape and also to access uh, all the necessary information, knowledge, data, and best practices uh, in order to inform their, their policy development uh, in this area. And um, we have a very short video uh, that, that I, I can ask the technicians to play uh, for you now, and then we can go into the details. So let's see whether the video will start now or not. What does the future of international cooperation on AI look like? <coughs> Eight intergovernmental organisations with complementary mandates have launched a single point of entry for AI policy. Globalpolicy.ai is a tool for navigating the international AI governance landscape to inform AI policy development. For more information, please visit globalpolicy.ai. Okay, thank you. So I, I ask the, I invite the participants uh, of the session to stay tuned to learn more about the usefulness and also the importance of, of this initiative. Uh, just before we start, let me briefly highlight what uh, we will do today. First, we will hear about the, the initiative um, uh, uh, and how everything started, uh, uh, what it does, you know, what functions it has, and then uh, we will have um, uh, a second session where I will ask the, the panelists uh, uh, who work uh, on, on, on this initiative and also many other initiatives to, to discuss how they uh, think that trustworthy AI and, and the tools uh, needed to, to, to ensure it can be achieved. And also at the end, we will have a, an open dialogue uh, between panelists and also the audience. Uh, we have a brilliant panel today with, with uh, five amazing speakers, uh, all of them you know, practicing uh, very uh, experienced uh, uh, experts of the field. So let me introduce them. Uh, I will start with Karin Perse from, from OECD. Hi, Karin. Uh, Karin is the, the head of the AI unit at the OECD division for, for digital economy policy and she is in charge of the OECD.AI Policy Observatory and also uh, of the OECD AI Network of Experts. And she did many, many things in the past. Um, uh, we also have uh, Irina Orsich 
uh, I hope I, I mentioned your name <laughs> properly, uh, who is, is a technology policy researcher with interest in transnational governance of AI, ethics of information and media economics, and um, oh, sorry, sorry, I, 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 that was Pratik. So we have Irina from, from, from European Commission, who works in the Director General for the Communications Network, Content and Technology, and she is the head of sector for, for AI uh, policy. We have Pratik Sibal, who is, who is a technology policy researcher with interest in transnational governance of AI. Uh, and and uh, he works with, with UNESCO, uh, UNESCO's Digital Innovation and Transformation section. And uh, we also have Alexandro uh, Tulkanov, who is a special advisor <clears throat> on digital development uh, at the Council of Europe. Uh, in Strasbourg, and he's a lawyer uh, with, with uh, uh, more than 16 years of experience in private and public sector. Um, and he dealt with, with uh, uh, information technology policy and regulation and, and, and issues like that. And finally, we have David uh, Reichel, who is a member of the research and data unit at the uh, EU's Agency for Fundamental Rights uh, based in Vienna. And, and his, his areas of expertise include st statistical data uh, analysis, uh, data quality, statistical data uh, visualization. And, and uh, uh, he's also very active in, in the international context and the negotiations focusing on AI policymaking. Um, so as you see, we have a wonderful panel. Um, and uh, uh, I will ask at this stage to uh, Karin, perhaps first, and also uh, after that, David, to say a few words about how uh, this initiative uh, started, you know, what is the background uh, of this initiative and, and, and uh, uh, what steps led to the, to the launch uh, of the initiative in, in, in uh, September. So Karin, the floor is yours. Thank you, Zoltan. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here today. Um, so the, the OECD's main platform to follow up on the implementation of the 2019 OECD AI principles is a, a separate platform, the OECD.AI policy observatory. But early 2020, in cooperation with partner IGOs, including the United Council of Europe and the K European Commission, we identified, and then Fundamental Rights Agency, we identified, uh, and this was, so this was two years ago, we really identified the need for a broader platform to bring together all of the work our partner IGOs and the OECD are doing on AI. And that is very complementary work given the different mandates that we all have. And that's how the idea for globalpolicy.ai was born. Again, early 2020, we didn't launch it until a little bit later, but uh, we started with a few organizations holding informal virtual calls uh, during the pandemic um, to see how we could, uh, to one, um, help policymakers navigate all of our initiatives that are different while being complementary. Um, two, keep each other up to date on our respective AI policy activities and try to ensure where we can interoperability between our initiatives. Of course, we have different memberships, so we can't. So, but, but it starts at the secretariat level. We try to do our part to try to ensure that interoperability and hope it stays till the end uh, through uh, our member negotiations and three launch projects together to advance trustworthy AI where our mandates intersect. And there are quite a few areas uh, where they do. Uh, and so that's how we came to the idea of a platform as a one-stop shop um, for our organization's initiatives on AI with some added features such as live news, a custom search so that policymakers interested uh, in a specific topic, AI topic like transparency can find relevant resources from all the IGOs on that topic, uh, a shared calendar of events and other, other, other functionalities. And so today, eight IGOs or eight organizations participate in this project and more organizations have expressed uh, interest in joining. So we, we look forward to welcoming a few more and to, and to launching uh, some more projects. Thanks. Back to you, Zoltan. Thank you, Karin. Uh, <clears throat> David, is there something that you would like to, to add to, to what uh, Karin just said? I hope so. 
No, thanks. Happy to. Uh, yeah, thanks very much. It's a big pleasure to to be here and discuss with you. Um, so I can only add a little more from my experience, based uh, as as I was part of this, like for, from the beginning, as an. Um, uh, as I mean, Karin said mainly how it came about, but I also think like from my side, so I work with the EU Agency for Fundamental Rights, where we started in around 2017 to really look more closely into AI and, and fundamental rights, um, as this obviously became more and more important on the EU policy agenda. And in a way, as, as Karin said, this, this really it wasn't planned on our side to do anything there. It just happens on a daily basis, you know, when our organizations also at high levels communicate. It's, it's so important for us to make sure to know what's going on at other levels and during such such bilateral calls because as Karin said it was during the pandemic um you to talk to others and they say do you know i mean did you talk to the guy from from this organization they really know more about this and are they are also dealing with this question and, and there is a project ongoing in this area and 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 so it was a bit of cascading effect that we said no no let's bring in someone from this organization and then this organization suggested another person and and so forth and so so quite quickly we were a really good group of people who could exchange just simply update what you're doing and then of course uh, all the credits really go to the OECD who who, who took the lead and, and pushed um, um, uh, with uh, also resources on this website and it, it was I have to say amazing how quickly uh, such organizations can agree on on joining on such a website, which I think just reflects the, the, the real need to work on, on, on AI policy in the area. And yeah, as also Karin said, it's, it's still so nice to see also the different mandates of the organizations just coming from their perspective, but still sharing um, yeah same concerns and this way just update each other. And also, of course, to complement the work and not do the same thing, yeah, which others are already doing. Thank you, David. <clears throat> Thank you, David. I think it's amazing to see that how you know, the, the, the need realized at expert level can lead to such an initiative, uh, uh, which seems to be uh, uh, something which will very much serve the interest of, of also of, of member states and, 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 and the stakeholders. So th thank you for, uh, for uh, uh, starting launching this initiative. Um, we can talk about you know, some other aspects of the, of, the, of the initiative a bit later, but uh, before we would do that, uh, I will ask from each of you uh, uh, a general question. Uh, uh, in your opinion, in what ways can intergovernmental organizations such as yours uh, enable the creation and implementation of trustworthy AI systems? Um, and what are the unique uh, projects that you are working on at, at, uh, within your organization? Uh, uh, what do you think how, how international organizations can, can really ensure that, that uh, AI systems that we have you know, out there already uh, work in the proper way? Um, uh, it would be interesting to hear from, from you know, each of you, you uh, uh, really how, how but or similarly or differently you see the role of your organization and also the role of intergovernmental cooperation in this field. So let's start perhaps with, um, uh, with UNESCO, uh, where, where uh, uh, a few weeks ago, the, the recommendations on the ethics of AI was adopted. I also had the opportunity to be there. It was really a, a, an amazing event, I have to say, at, at the... Uh, in, in Paris, I even saw you know, the DG coming down and you know, clapping and, and, and congratulating to, to all the member states. Uh, could you tell us a bit more about, about this recommendation also about, about the projects that you work on uh, at UNESCO? Thank you, Martin. Absolutely, thank you, Zoltan. Uh, so I think the first part of your question is really about what is the toolkit that organizations like ours have. Uh, so for instance, at UNESCO, um, we have 193 member states. So there is a lot of heterogeneity in uh, the needs expressed by member states. And um, what we try to do then is basically identify good practices and knowledge and ideas globally, then facilitate exchange of those ideas uh, which is kind of uh, bringing people together at conferences or discussions also as part of the ethics recommendation, then it feeds into setting up standards based on this knowledge. Then once we have the standards, then the member states ask us, 
Well, now we need to really implement these very high level standards at the national level. How do we go about that? Then comes our role in policy advice. So we develop policy frameworks to translate some of those principles. For instance, if we talk about the ethics of AI, um, we, you mentioned trustworthy AI. So it is, it is an element which is mentioned in the recommendation at two points around justice systems and also around data. So we develop frameworks which then translate these principles into national level, uh, it can be guidelines. Uh, for instance, we are going to be working on AI procurement systems in the justice system and produce guidelines for that. So then we give advice to concretely translate these standards into national level approach. However, then there's the other question which comes up, which is we need to have capacity to be able to implement these policies and capacities not only of policymakers, but also to involve civil societies. A, a big part of uh, the recommendation that we have is also about accountability. And we, when we talk about AI, uh, we are always talking about accountability. The civil society actors bring in that, uh, that accountability as well. So, so then we work upon capacity building. And then the final element is what, what, what brings us all together here is international cooperation because resources are limited. Uh, we want to all work together to complement each other's mandate. So that's one part of why we are all together. Second part is we have shared principles, like principles in the sense member states. Uh, if, if, as uh, David was mentioning before, uh, if, uh, if a particular member state is a member of Council of Europe, of uh, FRA, of OECD, and of UNESCO, uh, we all go, most likely sometimes the ambassador to the OECD and UNESCO is the same person. Uh, we go there and then say, oh, why are you not working together? It's quite weird. So, so that's the second element what brings us together. The third element, which I think is super interesting, uh, is the plurality of views. So each organization has different communities that they engage with uh, and different networks, and which, which is kind of a springboard for new ideas. And then once these ideas come up, we join discussions at the OECD, at the Council of Europe, they join UNESCO discussions. We kind of exchange those ideas, which globally improve standard setting also in each of these organizations. So that's also another raison d'etre of uh, being together here. Now, uh, I will not take too much time, but talking concretely about some of the initiatives as a follow-up to the recommendation, uh, we, we, we started working on capacity building, for instance. Uh, we identified, uh, we did some surveys of our member states, for instance, in Africa, where we asked about 32 member states as to what are their policy priorities and capacity building needs. The clear answer was, we need support in terms of strengthening capacities of judiciary to understand how this technology is being used, what are its legal implications, because a lot of times it, it so happens that the private sector players would come in, the software is sold, and then uh, there is either lack of concern about human rights implications, or there is a vendor lock-in and all kinds of administrative issues crop in. So there is a general need for capacity building in that sense. So we've launched uh, an initiative called the Judges Initiative. Uh, so UNESCO has been working since 10 years uh, on freedom of expression, access to information, and safety of journalists, and has trained about 23,000 judicial operators on these topics are in about 150 countries. So in 2020, we launched the development of this program around AI and the rule of law. And as first part, as first element coming out of this program is this book that we launched uh, just last week for judicial operators worldwide to participate in a dialogue with each other, learn from practices, look at the case law. This is just the first step. Then we go ahead and work with at the policy level with guidelines for procurement. Then we build networks of judicial operators because we also want to look at a community which can then bring these legal implications of AI to courts and, and, and have the jurisprudence evolve as well. So that's one chunk of work. And I, I, I would like to quickly mention another part, which is about policymakers, which is around competencies. So what we have, we, we are initiating in January this year is a, a global framework on what are the knowledge and skills that policymakers need for both digital governance and to enable digital transformation. This is an issue which a lot of our member states uh, basically are asking us. We as a government are the ones who are guiding our societies, but we ourselves are not sure if we have the 
if the, both the knowledge and the skills to drive that transformation. So we'll be launching global consultations from Latin America to Africa, to Europe, to Asia, uh, with different stakeholders to develop this framework. And of course, our partner organizations that we're working here today, uh, we'll, be in, uh, we'll be working with them to involve and get feedback. So these are two concrete elements where we are working on getting the principle of trustworthy AI to go through the actual actors who are going to implement this going forward. Yeah. Thank you, Pratik. These are very specific initiatives and given that uh, now you have the <clears throat> the recommendations adopted which is you know very complicated long document uh, uh, with a quite wide scope uh, just very briefly because i would also like to give the floor to the others can you tell us what tools will you use to help member states to implement the recommendations because I, I also yes as someone you know, coming from the government i also realize you know, very often that this is very difficult to see i mean to see clearly in in such a complicated uh, legal environment uh, and states really need the support the legislative assistance uh, that international organizations can can provide uh, uh, in such cases is there you know something like that planned uh, by unesco for sure. So, so there are two tools which are being planned. One is an ethics, ethical impact assessment tool, mm -hmm. and this is all in the works at the moment. And then is a readiness methodology for countries. And then countries can really take it up, assess where they lie, where they stand. And then once we have a contextual analysis of where a particular country is, uh, there is a follow-up on the other elements as to what are the needs. And then uh, the third element that I'll mention is around the co competency framework, where we are developing a self-assessment tool uh, for civil servants to actually look at where they stand with respect to this global framework of competencies that we'll develop. Because the, as I mentioned before, the member states that we have, there's a lot of heterogeneity. So we offer them the opportunity to choose at the level of development that they are at the moment, and then tailor their training needs accordingly. So I would, yeah. Okay, thank you, thank you for this. Okay, let's go to a bit more, yeah, to an organization which is a bit more limited membership. Uh, uh, so let's focus on, on the Council of Europe, okay? Uh, Alexandra, can you tell us what the Council of Europe does uh, or can do uh, in order to, to enable the creation and implementation of trustworthy AI systems, you know, what kind of initiatives you work uh, nowadays. You know, I mentioned uh, Kahai, uh, the ad hoc working group uh, of the Council of Europe focusing on AI, which just uh, completed its mandate uh, last week. Uh, uh, but there are also other initiatives. So please tell us a bit more about the Council of Europe uh, initiatives you are working on nowadays. Yeah, thank you, Zoltan, for this introduction. And um, I must say that uh, the Council of Europe uh, has been quite active uh, in that field of regulating artificial intelligence and coming up with uh, recommendations first, and later on, we might be uh, seeing some uh, binding uh, regulation also. And the process has not uh, started yesterday, of course. Uh, uh, previously, for example, one might see uh, in our recommendations, which were previously issued uh, more in the context, you know, of a big data analysis, for example, even in 2016 and 2017, when our, our um, committee of ministers issued those kinds of recommendations in the context, for example, of our uh, convention on, on the automated processing of personal data, which, of course, is a well-known uh, legal instrument, uh, which is not uh, limited in its participation to Europe only. It goes beyond Europe, I must say. And um, later on, uh, we had some sectoral activity across the organization, meaning that uh, we were not uh, immediately maybe coming up with uh, uh, the documents which would cover all applications of artificial intelligence in total, but still uh, uh, covering specific aspects like, for example, our uh, 
European Commission for the Efficiency of Justice, uh, to give one example, uh, has come up with the ethical charter on the use of artificial intelligence in judicial systems. Uh, and that was already in 2018. So uh, it's quite quite uh, uh, a few years ago. And that I would say was a good uh, basis for our future work. And uh, there, are, uh, there were other recommendations uh, we, which uh, uh, have been issued and uh, could be used for um, by the by the national governments uh, to 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 imp for the implementation of the principles we, which we are now talking about, and uh, as you've mentioned, it uh, was the case that uh, a special uh, ad hoc committee was created uh, uh, to to consider the possibility of coming up with. Uh, binding or non-binding or combination of uh, both um, document or legal instrument uh, within the Council of Europe. And uh, what has been done initially in that regard, there was a feasibility study, uh, which was used throughout uh, the work of this uh, committee, which as you've uh, correctly mentioned, uh, has completed it, um, its mandate uh, uh, just uh, recently. Uh, but the feasibility study, of course, was uh, done previously and uh, in 2020 it was published. So it's already available on our website for anyone to see what were the discussions back then and what was considered. And now, um, in accordance with our um, Committee of Ministers uh, um, deliberations and decisions which were uh, taken um, last uh, May, uh, we are going to um, get into the process of uh, negotiating uh, most likely a binding legal instrument for the Council of Europe member states. Uh, and the negotiations are about to start uh, in uh, May uh, of the next year, 2022. Uh, and we are going uh, most likely to have uh, not, not uh, then uh, now uh, net hoc, but a standing committee on artificial intelligence for that purpose to serve the interests of the CAI. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah. CIA, oh. but CAI. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> not <laughs> CIA, <laughs> definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Sure, yeah. for sure. <laughs> yes. And um, so we, we are going to have this um, um, outstanding process. Um, and uh, I think um, we, we will be able to. Uh, to, to see what comes uh, out of it. But uh, at, at the moment, for example, we, if we are talking about uh, um, more practical um, um, instruments, uh, I, I, can, uh, I can share with the public already that, uh, for example, we, we are considering uh, such uh, a thing as a, a human uh, rights, uh, democracy and the rule of law impact assessment as something which needs to be done for uh, a lot of AI applications and uh, the Council of Europe is considering the framework for that, how to operationalize those, those principles which uh, originate from the mandate of the Council of Europe, uh, which uh, circles around those three, three things, human rights, uh, democracy and the rule of law. Uh, these are our pillars. And uh, as, as one may recognize, there is certain notions which is pretty similar to that, but more narrow in its focus. For example, the data protection impact assessment, which the companies and governments already do when the, they are concerned with the uh, assessment of risks arising from the processing of personal data. But what we are now talking about is a broader thing and it uh, in, in incorporates uh, three elements, as I said, and it con concerns the application of uh, it concerns various AI applications, not necessarily um, strictly focused to personal data. So that uh, I would uh, briefly say. Thank you, Alexander. Uh, what I found find fascinating in case of the Council of Europe is that although it's a regional organization, the treaty that it will <clears throat> that it it uh, it will uh, negotiate in the coming two years. Uh, we'll most likely be open to, to 
non Council of Europe member states also, you know, because the, the in case of the, the Council of Europe practice, you know, this is possible. Just think about the Budapest, uh, you know, Budapest Convention on, on cyber crime. You know, uh, there are many uh, states which ratified it uh, uh, who, who are not uh, Council of Europe member states, but they still had the opportunity to do that. So as a result of that, it became a global standard. So although the Council of Europe is a regional organization, it has the mandate and also the capacity to, to um, do, I mean, to create standards which, which can have a global impact also. Um, uh, thank, thank you, Alexandro. Um, it's also interesting that you also mentioned impact assessment. You know, we also heard, heard uh, from UNESCO that they, they will also have something similar, uh, but I think it's also true for the European Commission, right? So also according to the, to the AI Act, uh, there will be also some kind of uh, assessment, um, uh, impact assessment, some kind of impact assessment uh, mechanism. Uh, Irina, could you tell us a bit more about your initiatives and also how they relate also to, 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 to perhaps to the global policy.ai initiative and whether you also work together with other organizations to ensure harmonization of the initiatives? Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, so the European Commission already has been supporting research in artificial intelligence since 2004, so for quite some time, but that it also came on our political, on our policy agenda has been comparably recently, so we have been working on the policy side since 2018 when we published a communication and um, there basically we were talking about three pillars. So first of all, we have a pillar of competitiveness innovation. We have a second one of the socioeconomic impact on society. And we have a third one on the ethical and legal issues. And since then we have been continuing to work on these three pillars, always with the basic assumption that AI is good. AI can do a lot of good to society, to health, to climate change, but indeed it also be a certain risk, risks for safety, for fundamental rights. So it's always these two coins, these two sides of the same coin we have been trying to work on. And in that spirit, this year in April, we have been, we the commission adopted an AI package and there we have one thing which is the so-called coordinated plan where together with member states we discuss and then we um, put in the plan measures we will implement in order to promote artificial intelligence. And there, for example, we are talking about the enabling conditions like computing capacity. We're talking about data, which is an important ingredient. We have the financing system. We have a lot of research. We have testing facilities, um, how to transfer AI into the market. Um, we have indeed uh, also something Platek was talking about, chapter on skills, because skills are absolutely key. Um, we have a chapter on international cooperation to get already here a bit into your last question. So where we say what kind of um, things we want to do to internationally cooperate. And that is one of the key things because um, if one thing would be absolutely fatter, it would be like a fragmented AI everywhere differently and everybody has different fears and everybody has different rules and everybody has different standards. So it's and we very have a much- So it's very <laughs> much on top of our agenda indeed to have as much um, cooperation as possible internationally, multilaterally, but also bilaterally. And this is also the spirit where we are um, 
here, but where we are also in other fora, like in the OECD, um, yeah. we are active. And with the Council of Europe, we follow um, everything. With UNESCO, we did follow. Um, we're working with Japan and with plenty of others because we really believe that this is a very multilateral issue. But okay, so there are still other things in the coordinated plan. So this is really what we want to do to promote AI. But in the same time, as I said before, we also see certain risks. So what we also adopted in April is a proposal for a regulation on artificial intelligence. Um, so there we really want to create the trust and in the same time, we don't want, or we only want to hamper innovation where it's really necessary. So you need to imagine this um, whole thing as a pyramid. Um, we have a risk-based approach. So you see a pyramid and at the bottom of the pyramid, you say about 75% of all the AI, 85% perhaps, where we don't see any risks for safety and for fundamental rights. That would be something like your spam filter in your computer. So easy things we all use on a daily basis. And um, there we don't believe that a regulation is necessary for some of them and for the companies developing them. It might well be very useful to um, have voluntary codes of conduct, ethic guidelines. So really to follow certain ideas while it's developing it. But here we don't want to have compulsory rules. Then on the next they, level, yeah, sorry. Yeah, sorry, so, so the, the, the regulation will be abiding at the moment, right? Uh, so uh, similarly to what, what the Council of Europe does, although in that case, it will be a treaty. In your case, it will be an EU, EU regulation, which is uh, binding by nature in contrast to, to the recommendation that we, uh, you know, that was celebrated by, by UNESCO and also to the principles, OECD principles on AI, which is of course, you know, non-binding. Uh, what is also interesting to see in case of the EU is that, for example, in case of um, uh, data protection, your GDPR also had an impact on other countries, which are non-EU countries. Uh, so, so uh, even on, uh, I, I think on some 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 UN uh, US um, uh, legislative regulatory initiatives. So it seems that that the EU can also influence. Uh, um, You know, processes in other countries. Uh, do you also expect that in case of the the EU regulation? So, do you think it could be a, it could become a, something like a global standard or or something that that will <clears throat> somehow influence uh, legislative work in other countries, also other continents? So the the idea is actually to have it influenced because um, the regulation would apply to all AI being put on the European market or being used in Europe and the EUs. Um, so which means that um, any AI independent from where it is developed and where it comes from, the moment it will be sold in Europe or it will be used in Europe would have to um, play by the rules. Let me just quickly continue on three other aspects yeah, if you allow. Um, so on the, like on the risk-based approach, what we want to do, and actually there we are different in some respect from the other organizations. So where we say that an AI has a high risk, we say from the beginning, okay, this is the type of use case, here you have a high risk. So it is not that the user for us needs to do the impact assessment, there at a later stage, a data protection impact assessment would come in. But we clearly say in that proposal, this is going to be a high risk use case. So this will have to play by certain requirements. And these requirements come in, in the moment where this AI is being marketed in Europe, which means that it's before it is used, before somebody employs the AI. There, for example, you would have to do a data protection impact assessment, um, which stems from GDPR, but not according to our regulation. So, and then last point, so you're having requirements, you have them in the moment they get, um, the AI gets on the market is, or is being used, then you need to comply with them. 
but in order to make it not too difficult to comply with them, we want to have technical standards for these requirements. And here again, we are in the international field. And here again, we also want to cooperate with international standardization organizations, and we don't want to do something very, very close. And the very last point, there are also some very few AI systems where we believe that all these rules wouldn't help. And this is why we propose even to prohibit them. Thank you, Irina. I just realized that it's already half past five. Uh, so, you know, we have only 20 minutes left and we still want to give uh, a chance uh, uh, to the audience to, you know, to raise some questions. Uh, but before that, I will ask Corinne and also David, uh, you know, could you say a few words about your initiatives very briefly, especially how you see uh, those initiatives in the context of the global policy.ai? So let's link it to the, you know, the initiative, that, which is the main topic of our, of our discussion. And then, and then you know, we can go to, the, uh, go to other questions. So Corinne, let's, let's start with you and then, and then David, uh, but please make it short, okay? Sorry. Um, sure. sure. Um, thank you, Zoltan. Uh, I think um, just to, to go straight to your second question, I think that all of our work, all of our work at at, uh, at the OECD would ideally be useful to the Global Policy.ai initiative um, because the goal of the work is to be useful. Our, uh, you know, just to take a step back on what is the OECD uh, and what we're trying to do, I think, for, from based on our mandate, a key challenge it, for us is really developing policy frameworks for trustworthy AI based on evidence, analysis, and testing, and try to tr really try to ensure that our policies, practices, and monitoring mechanisms for trustworthy AI are, are interoperable uh, internationally. So but we have a different mandate from a lot of others um, and the OECD, if you compare it to our partners, is relatively comparatively small uh, and focused in the sense that it, it's really focused on economic and policy frameworks uh, quite upstream in the policy development process. Compared to, for example, uh, UNESCO and, and Pratik described some of the capacity building exercises or, or the European Commission, Irina described, uh, you know, the, the regulation, the coordinated plan, which are, which, which are much, much wider mandates are a much more upstream, uh, which is you know, just different, but what it allows us to do, which I think is a value add, um, is to, because it's small and focused, is to coordinate between these different policy areas. So uh, this means that we can actually bring together different policies. So we cover all areas of policy, except for defense, but you know, this means that we can fairly, fairly easily, compared to others, bring together the policy, the different policy communities that are all being impacted by AI at, at various speeds, um, from uh, labor to tax to consumer to protection, uh, consumer protection to the environment. All these taxation is a is a large one as well, um, and uh, and this is important because you know these areas of policy are going to be interdependent, and so it's it's is somewhat easier for us to coordinate just by virtue, you know, again of being more focused, a little bit more high, high fo focused on, on one specific part of the policy development process. And then um, another thing just to mention is that we, in, in the digital arena, we really, really, uh, we really, really, you know, uh, focus on rooting our work in multi-stakeholder processes that bring together uh, all stakeholder groups from the outset, from the beginning. So it, at the end of the day, it's, we are an intergovernmental organization, so the outputs are agreed to by governments, but a lot of the reflection and a lot of the input comes from multi-stakeholder groups, which is which is critical. Um, so in terms of uh, global policy.ai, I'm not going to go through the projects we have at the OECD. Uh, most of the projects that we have are really trying to implement the, um, the OECD AI principles, make them operational and be useful. Uh, and the goal of these projects are to be useful as useful as possible to as wide a community as possible. Um, and so just, I'll give one example, which is we've, we've uh, nearly finalized a framework to classify AI systems, which is about, you know, acknowledging that different AI systems raise different risks 
and breaking down those systems into kind of manageable components so that you can classify these systems and identify a characteristic, a technical characteristic, a context, a user characteristic with a risk. Um, and we think, we hope that that work, and that work is now turning into work that is, uh, or, you know, le we're leveraging that work to develop uh, a risk, uh, uh, risk impact assessment um, and in cooperation with as many uh, of our partners as possible and other uh, stakeholder groups as well, of course. And so we hope that that can be useful and hopefully feed into processes, um, you know, where as, as appropriate in the commission, uh, in, in the US and in, in the in NIST and, and elsewhere. Um, yeah, well, what I can tell you, Karen, is that, that uh, the work that you did uh, or you've been doing in the OECD was very much appreciated also by CAHAI uh, in the Council of Europe. Uh, you know, we, we cooperated on on, uh, on on issues like definitions, what kind of definition should be used, what kind of classification should be used. Um, and and I, I, I know that the Council of Europe and also its member states, including us, uh, very much appreciated your 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 efforts, uh, and I think it also helped to you know to somehow harmonize the the language that we all use. Uh, given the the shortage of time, uh, I will ask now David to 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 say a few words about uh, his agency's uh, initiatives. Of course, your focus is on fundamental rights, uh, a bit similar to what what the Council of Europe does. Uh, uh, tell us more about how you see your organization uh, uh, in this context and, and how it can help, you know, trustworthy AI. Uh, uh, yeah, thank you. Good. Thanks very much. Sure, I'm aware of the time, so I'll, I'll rush through and I'm happy to answer any questions or also follow up otherwise with people if there's more interest. So I work for the European Union Agency for Fundamental Rights. Uh, the EU has over 40 specialized agencies that were created to support the EU institutions on different areas, on a broad range of different areas in the area of EU competence. Um, our mandate is to collect and analyze data on fundamental rights issues, and this way to assist the EU institutions, the Council, the Commission, the Parliament, with expertise and data on fundamental rights, uh, and as well as the member states. Um, so we're working in a EU context, and when we all started working several years ago on AI, as it became obvious that there are many fundamental rights issues involved, and, and we had to, to gather uh, information and data on it, we, we also set out in the beginning to, to, to work on guidelines and recommendations, but I, I would say policy making really overtook us, and, and the many initiatives on many areas at EU level, but also Council of Europe, um, were working on this, so, so we really try to contribute uh, meaningfully to these processes with delivering uh, policy uh, and highly applied research. Um, we were also a member, um, the head of our research unit of the high level expert group on artificial intelligence. Uh, and I was an observer where a trustworthy AI was also discussed. And from our perspective- In the EU. Yeah. In the EU, in the EU, yes, of course. Um, and from our perspective, trustworthy AI is fundamental rights compliant AI. That says our mandate and that's our focus. And, and yeah, we want to go beyond. And I, I think that's really important. So two points to make uh, um, for, for the, this discussion. One is that it's important, was important for us to bring a rights-based approach to the discussions. Um, why that? Um, there's a lot of discussion, what is ethics, uh, what is human rights and so forth. Um, but it's quite clear that we have uh, democratically agreed established standards on how our societies should function. At the global level, we have the Bill of Rights with the two covenants, uh, the nine core treaties, human rights treaties at the United Nations as a very good global starting point. The Council of Europe has uh, over 220 treaties where more than 30 out of them can be considered core human rights treaties. Our frame of, of uh, analysis is the Charter of Fundamental rights in the EU, which puts quite a high and strong protection on fundamental rights in the EU. And I think it was really important to bring this into these discussions because for many it was a bit a novelty, but it was really important to draw on the expertise that was collected on human rights and not building ethics frameworks from scratch. 
Um, that's not against ethics. Ethics are useful and important. It's part of it. Uh, it's also useful for the implementation. But from uh, uh, but member states signed up to protecting human rights, and that's why I think it's an important starting point. So that's uh, one of the first missions in a way. But the second and core work is doing uh, applied research, and so so we we, we did uh, several publications on, on discrimination, on face recognition, on data quality and AI, and and the study on the more horizontal analysis and fundamental rights implications of AI based on, on, on interviews with people using AI. And here we highlight mainly three areas as a minimum um, that, that like trustworthy or, or fundamental rights compliant AI should of course process data in line with data protection law um, and, and, and uh, secure privacy of people, uh, not discriminate people based on their protected characteristics when AI is applied. And thirdly, also make sure that you uh, uh, ensure access to justice, so to, to offer an effective remedy for people complaining about the use of AI. But still making the point that all fundamental rights can be impacted in one way or the other when AI is used, uh, because it's a, such an ubiquitous um, um, technology that it can be used in any area, and depending on the area, um, it can be impacted on. And I think there is still some lack of trust um, uh, in the population when you ask people, for example, in the EU, when we ask them um, uh, in our fundamental rights survey, how many people would share their facial images with public administration for identification purposes. It was only 17% in the EU saying, yes, I would do that. It's only 6% who would share that with private companies. And that's obviously a blunt question like this without giving any further context. It just mm -hmm. shows that if you don't provide enough context and information about the use, people won't pick up the technology and then it's not worth developing. I think it's needed for trust. Yeah, it's, it's, it's clearly, uh, we, we can see that clearly. And I think it's also good to see that <clears throat> I think each of your organization also uh, puts um, uh, emphasis also on the human rights aspect, uh, including OECD and UNESCO. Uh, so so I, think, I think the human rights focus is, is there more or less. Uh, given that we only have yeah, not much time uh, left, I also have a question and I want very brief answers, okay, from, from some of you at least. So how do you see global policy that AI help in cooperation and fostering this process of uh, enabling trustworthy AI at the present and also in the future? Uh, what, what role do you see for, for this initiative in the future? Uh, you know, given the fact that now we have you know, all these regulatory initiatives, uh, uh, similar mandates or, at, you know, or, or com com complementing mandates, uh, many organizations working on, 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 on similar issues, uh, what will happen? What should this initiative, what could this initiative do? Let's start with Karin, okay, and then, and then we will go to the others. And please, one minute maximum, okay. Okay, I, I, I have a lot of uh, ideas, but I'll focus on the most important one and the most short-term one that I, I see as being uh, very important, the value of the importance of this uh, global policy.ai initiative in the, in the short term. I see a key role for uh, this initiative to um, map out the different tools and instruments and map out the, you know, the, the because people, policymakers and others are a bit confused because these are different. We need help. <laughs> these, are, we need help. these are different instruments, but in fact, if you look at the substance, they overlap. They the, many of the principles are are the same. So I, I see. I think our next step as a group is really to map out. You know the relationships. Well, when we say trustworthy AI, we're actually this is the same principle. Maybe uh -huh. it's a different angle but you know we're talking about the same thing and here are the resources pertaining to that from these different organizations so i think the first role the most urgent here is to help uh policymaker our policymaker communities and and, and others uh, understand the linkages and and there are very many between our different okay. initiatives and thank you let's now go to alexandra just a few sentences yeah, yeah, if briefly, I would say that I think uh, it is important for us to help each other to inform the um, rulemaking process in our uh, processes in our organizations. And that this is where we should help because if, of course, the end result is up to the delegations, member states or whatever, but we can make this uh, uh, mutually uh, more informed. 
And if we are talking just briefly, uh, again, for, for example, uh, of the concept of trustworthy uh, AI, if we refer again to OECD principles, that means that uh, the systems should be uh, human rights and privacy compliant, fair, transparent, explainable, robust, secure, and safe. You know, there are several components of it and each component uh, needs to be like developed further in terms of like, for example, we, we are talking about fairness there are toolkits to interpret the fairness. And we know, for example, from the polls, from the service, from the industry, the data scientists, which really need to be concerned with how to fairly process the data which they have to avoid biases and so on, the, uh, only uh, like half of them approximately know about that those frameworks, practical instruments ex exist. So there is not enough uptake. And I think we can help with that. Okay, thank you, Alexandra. Pratik or Irina, do you well, would yeah, would you like to add something to this? Uh, something very brief. Um, I, I can I can quickly add something. So I I would just say that at as we go further, we would also like to involve Global South voices because there is a lot of use cases and implementation of some of these tools or new ideas emerging. I think this is an important conversation to put different practices, principles emerging around the world in different contexts in conversation with each other to build that robust robustness in our analysis and our systems. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you. Irina? Um, it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity to exchange, to raise awareness between us, but also like with all our with all our um, people working with us um, with that we can hopefully really also um, help not to have too much fragmentation but to have like smooth systems operating with each other um, and at the end it could even prepare something like um, the future governance but that's rather long term thank you Yes, I, I, I also believe that what you know, for a policymaker, what is important is to have <clears throat> uh, initiatives. It, it's not a problem if, if there are different initiatives, but they should go into the same direction at least. And maybe you know, policymakers can choose between you know, certain uh, uh, type of regulations, uh, but, but, but at least they should be somehow harmonized and not conflicting. Uh, I also see that there are many questions in the chat, uh, and I saw that many of you responded to that. Do you see any question there that you would like to perhaps uh, answer at this stage? You know, we have only two minutes left. Um, uh, did we miss something uh, which is extremely important? Yeah, it's a pity that we don't have much time. Uh, one more time. I could add a sentence on the question. Sorry, I could add a sentence on one the last question in the chat. Okay, so yeah, so please, please. I know about the time. Uh, that's a question of a fundamentally standard approach in the ethics domain um, and, and yeah. different areas. I think, as as I mentioned, I think the starting point is the internationally agreed standards in the human rights framework. Uh, it really works well on the AI domain as well. You can just apply it in this direction. So I think that's really a good starting point for standards and, and, and the way forward to also just stay in cooperation and talk to each other because we don't have enough resources to du duplicate our work. Okay. okay, thank you, David. I see that we only have one minute left. So I will. I think we will have to close now. I think it shows also the, 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 the activeness, activity of the, of the participants show that there's a, uh, an interest in, in, in this initiative, uh, and we could talk about many other issues. Uh, so I think we will need to have another uh, round sometime, hopefully in the near future. Um, uh, I encourage all those who followed us today to, to regularly check the, the website of the globalpolicy.ai on you know, their news, you know, uh, uh, live news also. And, 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 and I also know that the, the members also update the information very frequently. So, so please check the website, you know, share it with others and use it. Uh, that's, the, that's the idea. Uh, thank you, Karin, Irina, Alexander, David, and, and Pratik for the, for the valuable discussion, thought-provoking discussion. It's a pity that we couldn't deal with everything or many other issues, um, uh, but, but, but uh, I very much appreciate your, your um, you, you being present here. 
I wish uh, all the best to the to the audience also, and also to you, and enjoy the rest of the conference. And and thank you, and have a good evening. So, thank you. And can I, if I could just add a add a small word? I I, I would just like to thank Zoltan Please. for your fantastic um, uh, chairmanship, and also thank uh, my colleague Francesca Chica, who 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 did a lot of the heavy lifting for uh, this event today. So I wanted to acknowledge her role here. Um, thank thank you. you for that addition. It was very important. And yes, we, we appreciate all the work uh, by our colleagues also who put you know, the, all this together. Um, uh, so yeah, hopefully, hopefully the audience enjoyed it. Um, we will continue. We will need to continue for sure. So thanks once again. And then, and then yeah, see you soon, I hope. Yeah. Okay, enjoy the rest of the conference. Bye-bye.